final straw for this community. On Triple J. Yeah, for years, youth crime has been impacting communities across Australia. In Alice Springs, it's been in the headlines for years. You might remember the Prime Minister flew in last year. It became a big political issue as well. Some locals feel like they're at their wits' end and they're tired of feeling unsafe. And then there are others who say systems are failing young people, governments are doing nowhere near enough to address the root causes of the violence. It's all come to a head this week. Violent, chaotic scenes broke out across Alice Springs CBD. The NT government put a curfew in place, so now under-18s aren't allowed out at night. To fill us in on what's happened, because there's been quite a bit, and how the community feels about it, here's Angel Parsons. On Tuesday afternoon in Alice Springs, unrest and violence really escalated. Mate, they're taking 20 metre jumps and jumping in the glass trying to smash it. Including this attack on a pub. Oh, she's got a brick. It's escalated big time. They've smashed, they've smashed through one door already. Up to 150 people were reportedly rioting through town. Police seized 50 weapons and arrested five people. Police say some of the violence was related to the death of an 18-year-old man in a car crash earlier this month. That's led to family feuds and that's what erupted in Alice Springs. But after years of growing unrest related to youth crime, the latest incidents triggered calls from some politicians who want the federal government to step in and do something about it, including the local mayor. You know, we thought it was bad a year ago. That that was way worse than a year ago. The federal opposition spokesperson for Indigenous Australians, Senator Jacinta Numpajin Price, even wants the defence force brought into town. To make the people of Alice Springs feel some sense of safety once and for all. And so this was the Northern Territory government's answer announced yesterday. My government will declare an emergency situation in Alice Springs. That means police will have the power to enforce a curfew in the Alice Springs CBD for people who are 18 years and younger. As of last night, under 18s have a curfew. If they're caught in town between 6pm and 6am, police can take them home or to another safe place. The curfew will last for two weeks, covering the school holidays, and will be extended if the government deems it to be effective. Here's Chief Minister Eva Lawler today. It was a quiet night for young people in Alice Springs, and that's what Alice Springs people want to see. Extra police have been sent into the town to enforce the curfew. The curfew is but one measure. There will continue to be a range of complex issues. Some feel that this was necessary. This is a 14-day reprieve for the community. And I think it's been long overdue now that we start building some sort of relations um, in regards to working with police and with community for community safety. But some young people say they're disappointed and really don't rate the government's communication with them. It's really unfair that a lot of Aboriginal young people in our list have licence. We can't really show you that we are of age or 18, so how do they determine that? Also, we're not sure if it's all youth. Is it just Aboriginal youth? Is it white youth, multicultural youth? They're not really clarifying who's actually intended on this curfew. Alice Springs youth worker Amani Francois is 18. She says people are confused and there's so much mistrust and hurt already in the community. We're not going to trust the police, especially with the inquest that happened last month. You know, like we're feeling a great amount of fear and it's only inflicting nothing but terror for the streets, especially in the CBD of Alice Springs. The federal MP for Lingiari, Marion Scrimjaw, reckons the curfew will help, but there can't be knee-jerk responses. It's time for all sides to stop playing politics with this issue. It's too important. Others have grim predictions about the curfew. This is June Oscar from the Australian Human Rights Commission. Often these measures will disproportionately affect First Nations people, and they always do. And um, sadly, this is another example of uh, a punitive approach imposed from the top and outside and is destined to fail because the solutions do not have the involvement of the community. Hack on Triple J. 
Angel Parsons with that update. I want to get into this more with someone who's looked quite a bit at curfews in the past, not just in Australia but overseas, Uh, had a big look at the research internationally. Terry Goldsworthy is a criminologist at Bond University. He's also a former Queensland detective. He's with us now. Terry, thank you very much for coming on Hack. At face value, what do you make of this move to put a curfew in place in Alice Springs? You know, I accept it as a short-term measure. I think there were some issues there in the last 48 hours that the police lost control of certain areas of the town and they needed to do something to regain that. Whether this will be an effective long-term strategy will be another matter. I don't know what will happen at the end of the 14 days, but the police have surged in 60 extra officers there. How long they can sustain that is also another question. But there's got to be some long-term outcomes looked at as to how they address these uh, antisocial behaviours. You know, a 14-day period is not going to resolve it. I mean, you've looked into curfews in the past, what the research has told us. What does the evidence say about curfews in general? Yeah, look, it's a bit mixed. Uh, there's some, been meta, some metadata analysis done over the US that says that they were effective in reducing crime. Uh, and then there's other ones that say that they're ineffective in terms of reducing crime or youth uh, issues, etc. There was a curfew over in Northbridge in WA, commenced in 2003, and, you know, there was an analysis done of that in 2017 that said it wasn't effective, that even though the crime had initially reduced uh, after the curfew, it also reduced in other areas around in Perth where there was no curfew. So I think curfews for youths are problematic in terms of how are they going to be enforced, how difficult is the area to police. Like there's a fairly small area in terms of Alice Springs that they've declared uh, the high-risk area and it is surrounded, I was looking at the map before, it is surrounded by other suburban areas. So uh, will the, uh, you know, the problems move or be uh, displaced in those areas would be a question worth considering. What approaches do work in addressing youth crime? Like in like your research, have you found like some areas that are particularly useful or is it, you know, just quite different in Alice Springs that different approaches need to be taken? Yeah, I think Alice Springs is probably different uh, in its dynamics to say well, I'm on the Gold Coast, how you might respond to youth crime on the Gold Coast here. Generally, in terms of youth crime, you can look at a couple of issues. and They are, are generally divided into pre-crime, the crime itself, and post-crime. You know, we know that youth crime is multifactorial. There's a whole range of causations and effects that are causing the crime. We had some data come out in Queensland quite recently that tells us in 2003, for instance, 70% of our uh, youth offenders reoffended within 12 months. You know, looking at the complexity of those young offenders, 81% had used at least one substance. 38% of them had used amphetamine. Uh, you know, other challenges they have are, you know, a lack of engagement of education. You know, about 50% hadn't engaged in training or education. They're exposed to uh, domestic violence in the home. And, you know, about 48% of those offenders, 44% had some kind of mental health or behavioural disorder that was either diagnosed or suspected. So all of those things are your pre-crime issues that if you could address may well stop your crime happening. If that's not being done, then we have the crime issue. And that's where I think you see things like the curfew come in that are designed to ensure community safety. I mean, well, I think most of us have seen the footage now where we had people besieged in a hotel there in, in broad daylight. You just can't have things like that going on. And then once you move on from that, then you have to look at what happens post-crime, uh, where you have these offenders and particularly serious repeat offenders. And in Queensland, we, we actually classify them now on an evidence base and have a court declaration to that effect. Figures we got last week in the Cape, we got about 482 serious repeat offenders in Queensland as of December last year. So those are the offenders that it's all going well to build extra detention centres as we're doing, and we'll have a new one open at the end of this year with an extra 70 beds. But while they may be sentenced to a period of uh, detention, you need to ensure that there's good rehabilitation programs engaging them in there and also when they get out so they just don't fall back into that cycle of reoffending. This is Hack. I'm Dave Marchese. I'm speaking with Dr Terry Goldsworthy, a uh, former police officer, detective, now an associate professor in criminology at Bond University. We're talking about curfews generally and youth crime, uh, strategies that have worked in the past, um, others which maybe haven't and what the research tells us. 
We've heard from some, including June Oscar from the Human Rights Commission and Indigenous Rights Advocate, who's said that this approach in Alice Springs is punitive, it's destined to fail. What do you make of those comments? Yeah, look, I, when you're looking at curfews, it's always the issue of how are they going to measure success? What parameters are they putting in there to say this is the success? So, you know, I guess, is it the stopping of crime in the short term? Do they see that as a success? I, su- I suspect they would there at the moment. You know, what you should be looking for, I guess, in terms of success is long-term reduction of crime. You know, that's problematic when you've only got a 14-day strategy. I mean, this is designed simply to make the streets safe again. How long that will last after the curfew finishes, if, it's, if it is put off, will be anyone's guess. How long they can surge an extra 60 police in there is another question in terms of resourcing. Is it punitive? Well, it, it, may, it may well be. I mean, you may be capturing 18-year-olds, under people under the age of 18, who aren't necessarily out there engaging in crime, etc., but, you know, I guess when you've got these kind of circumstances, it can come problematic in terms of targeting groups. And that's why I think, um, you know, if you're going to have curfews, my recommendation was that you use targeted curfews if you're going to use them. So you identify your offenders, you place them on a curfew and you target them with resourcing. So that means you go around and perform a check, to make sure they're adhering to the curfew. And if they're not, then you take the relevant action against them. I'm interested in your take, Terry, as a criminologist, but also someone who is a former detective who has worked, you know, within police, do you think there's a big issue of young people not trusting the police? And do you think police need to be doing more to get on top of that and to addressing that? Yeah, look, there should be uh, a couple of aspects to any policing response. One would be the community partnership policing that you would be seeking to establish out there. And that is getting, um, you know, young people to take notice of their own elders, et cetera, getting them to come in and and try and control some lawful behaviours that are going on. Uh, And then you have, on the other hand, you probably describe it as punitive, but the enforcement actions by the police where they will arrest and criminally charge people. Both of those things have a role to play, you know, the community policing aspect as well as the uh, pure enforcement operational aspect of policing. The problem is, you know, you know, if you're going to engage in that community policing, you really also need other government organisations, even non-government organisations, to probably be with you as the police move in to do that to address those complex causation factors that I outlined uh, before. You know, it, the police aren't there to deal with someone who's got an addiction issue in terms of methamphetamine or ice or something. That's where you need a health response to be there with the police to assist in engaging that community policing. Dr Terry Goldsworthy from Bond University, appreciate you coming on Hack. Thanks for that. Hack. Everything for it just to all get cancelled, like, you know, in the blink of an eye is is terrifying. Something catastrophic is going on when you've got Splendour, Falls, Groove in the Moo, Vintage Vibes, Dark Mofa, all taking a year off to calibrate. What does the future of festivals look like? On Triple J.